Hello, my name is Chip Ling, and you're listening to Total EM. We have a Practical Pocus special, and here it goes. All right, so I want to talk to you about the many roles of Pocus. And while this can seem intuitive to some, to others, you may only be using one or two functions of Pocus if you're using it for anything at all. And because of that, I wanted to show the diversity of point of care ultrasound or POCUS by showing many different scenarios. And, and really, I wanted to limit it to just kind of five key ones where I can see a big change in management very quickly using this simple device. And so for that reason, I wanted to make sure to highlight that as well as how to get started in using POCUS yourself because it is something that is a game changer, not only for you, but for your patients and your departments where you work at, it can be a huge deal there as well. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about, again, some examples of where ultrasound can truly save the day. Let's talk about this first case here really quickly. Now, this is something that you may see and you may not think much about. So you have someone who comes in you know, it's summertime, it's fall, it's starting to cool off a little bit. And what do they do? They want to walk outside and enjoy it. And they walk out barefooted, of course. Well, a few days ago, this person went outside, was walking around, stepped on something, not really sure what, but stepped on something, and they kind of ignored it. However, now a few days later, they're starting to notice this red swollen area. And with that in mind, what would you do with this? How would you treat this right now without point of care ultrasound? How would you take care of this? So I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. But what I will also mention are some of the ideas that other people have given and, and thought about and, and may do. So let's talk about you may end up saying, hey, there could be a foreign body in there. You might take some x-rays. You might just refer it off to podiatry to take care of further. Some will say, well, it is the foot. I'm not really going to touch it, but it probably needs IND. And so I'll give some antibiotics until they can see the podiatrist or someone who's willing to cut this open. And then there are going to be others who are going to be willing to do the incision and drainage, that IND now. But what would happen if you had POCUS, if you had point of care ultrasound right there, ready to go so you can assess this patient? What would you find? Well, you might see something more like this. So this is an anechoic area of fluid. You can see a little bit like maybe hypoechoic there at the bottom, but you have, and that just means like black and then less black basically. And you have a well circumscribed area. So this could very well look like an abscess, but you're smart and you know you have to assess this multiple ways. So you throw on some color and this is what you see. Notice the mix of blue and red. These are directional. I won't dive too much into this because, again, I'm not really trying to teach you POCUS. I'm trying to explain why POCUS is so beneficial. All of a sudden, what looked like an abscess is actually a blood vessel. And why that matters is because if you cut this open, you'd be cutting into this blood vessel here. And what that means here in a second, we're going to talk about a little bit more. But also you can see how easy it was to be deceived by this material here at the bottom because you would think, oh, that's that's probably just some of the uh, you know purulence of the abscess and it's really just that. But what we're finding out is now this is actually a clot that has formed. So what is this? You know, what what would you do with this? How would you change your mind? Would this have changed your management? I hope so. I hope if you had point of care ultrasound and you were not already thinking that this was a vessel that you would start changing your mind here because it's not truly a vessel. What you're seeing is a pseudo aneurysm and you get this classic yin yang sign. So you have a mixture of red and blue because you have two di different directions of blood flow there versus what you originally were anticipating this. This is an example of an abscess here. You can see the mix of material in there. You can see how the borders are a little more irregular in nature. And here you see much more well circumscribed. Uh, you can even see a little bit more of a hyperechoic edge, which is consistent with the, the blood vessel itself versus this is much thinner, more irregular, you know, really looks like a true abscess. So again, 
ultrasound right here saved you from a bad outcome, both for you and the patient, because you were able to recognize that this wasn't a simple cutaneous abscess. What this ended up being was a pseudoaneurysm, and you can get them to the right level of care. Let's talk about another case about trying to get people to the right place. You see a finger like this, red, hot, swollen, and this uh, person says that they hurt their right middle finger when they had an injury to it, just kind of got a little drill bit and just made some contact with it. Didn't think much of it, but a couple of days later, now they've got this going on. You could be really clever and you could do this. You could do canaval signs. So you see a sausage digit, which it does look bigger. It's, it's completely erythematous and it, it's swollen. It's held in some passive flexion right now. I bet if you pushed it back, that passive extension would be pretty painful. And then if you percussed along the flexor tendon sheath, that would probably also be pretty painful. If you're lucky, you'll have all four canaval signs. But realistically, in most cases I've seen, I've only seen one where they had all the signs and it's usually they only have some. Well, what happens is that at least with the places I've worked at, you get these patients and you wanna get them to orthopedic surgery because you know that they really need surgical management and they say, well, you know, maybe we should do some antibiotics and I'll see them in a couple of days in the office and if that's not working, then whatever. But you know that that person needs help sooner than that. One way that I have consistently got orthopedic surgeons involved was to do an ultrasound. And I'm gonna show you the still image first because it's a little bit easier to see, but you can see like what looks like a little bit of cobblestoning, which is consistent with cellulitis. You have these really thin, uh, bright hyperechoic lines or white lines that you can see here, and that's consistent with the tendon sheath. And then you have a little bit of uh, dark hypochoic area, almost anechoic behind it, which is consistent with fluid. And then you have this hyperechoic stripe with shadowing completely behind it, that's the bone. And what I'm seeing here is evidence of an infection, and it's surrounding the area of the tendon, making me think that this is truly an infectious flexor tenosynovitis. So I'm able to send these images or at least able to describe what I'm seeing and now convince the surgeon that this is someone who needs the appropriate level of care. They need to stay in the hospital, they need surgery, they need IV antibiotics versus just sending them home and I'll see them in a couple of days, hopefully. But also you can explain to the patient what's going on and the importance of doing what we're doing versus sending them home. And this improves both patient understanding and patient satisfaction, which are two big things that POCUS is able to do while you're still at the bedside. You can figure this out in seconds, maybe minutes, and entirely change the disposition. So this is a really positive example here of how you can really help these patients, just like all the other examples I'm gonna give you. Speaking of, let's talk about another person who got injured. So this time it's a child who comes in, they've had a fall, and they have some wrist pain. You get x-rays, and this is what you see here. So it looks like normal growth plates. You don't see any buckling. You don't see any signs of fractures at this point. What would you do? Well, let's say they maybe have some more focalized tenderness around the distal radius. Does, does that change your management? Uh, are you going to go ahead and just splint these people? What if the parents are resistant? Or what if the patient's really resistant? Well, if you don't know it's a true fracture, then do we really need to do all this? Can we just follow up with our doctor in a few days? Well, what you can do is once again, you can use ultrasound to help give you a better idea. Now, what you're actually looking at here is the knee joint. Uh, and the way you can tell is there's the patella right there that shows up. Going back to the beginning of this clip, so you can see bone, there's a growth plate, knee joint, bone growth plate. And so that would be, so proximal tibia again, growth plate, growth plate. And notice how smooth it is. These are smooth rounded edges. And that helps tell me that that is a growth plate versus a fracture. A fracture will look like this. Now this is a little hard to see on the zoomed in view. We're only a centimeter deep here. But what we are seeing is that there are two hyperechoic lines, that's the bone, and there's even a little overlap there, which is really consistent with a fracture. And that's also what you're seeing here. So sharp, pointed, overlapping some, not directly in contact with each other. So there's, there's some overriding and some separation. This is an easy way to identify a fracture. And so now you can take this, 
show the parent, show the patient what's going on and really help encourage the appropriate disposition and treatment for this patient and now feel more confident yourself that you're doing the right thing for them versus before you may not have been able to detect that with just plain x-rays. Another common one, especially this time of year and especially with everything else that's going on in the world with COVID-19, these patients who come in, what do you do? You've got this older gentleman here, he's coughing, and you got your handy dandy stethoscope there. Notice how no one has uh, surgical masks on or any other form of PPE, that's fine. But what, you, what you're doing here is you're auscultating and you might be able to detect wheezing, but are you really confident in your detection of rouse and ronchi consistently for CHF and COPD and pneumonia? I mean, really, is that something that you feel really comfortable with just by itself? Or do you want some imaging? Okay, well, you can do chest x-ray. You may be asking yourself, well, why don't I just do chest x-ray? Why do I need to, to bother with ultrasound? That's because ultrasound is more sensitive. It catches more cases than the x-ray does. And it's really, really beneficial here. The way we do this is with what's called the blue protocol. I'm not going to go through the entire blue protocol. We just simply don't have the time to go through all the steps. But we look at A lines, B lines, and C lines and that can help us with detecting pneumonia versus normal lungs, pulmonary edema, we can even pick up pneumothoraces. And indirectly, we can also kind of help pick up COPD or asthma as well as pulmonary embolism. Let me show you examples of what we're looking at here. So what we see here is subcutaneous tissue. This is looking at the anterior lung. So we're looking at the, the basically the most anterior portion of the chest. We see rib, rib shadow, rib, rib shadow. And right here, that bright white line where there's some kind of movement there, a little bit of shimmer going on there, that's your pleural line. So that's where the lung makes contact with the chest wall. The fact that we can see that movement there tells us that there's lung sliding, which means that we are having lung that's rubbing against the site. So it's not a pneumothorax. If we didn't see any movement there, I'd be concerned about pneumothorax potentially. Additionally, notice how you see white lines, these hyperechoic lines, equally spread out. These are called A lines, and A lines are good. You want A's, that's normal aerated lung. We like to see that. Versus over here, this is kind of more of a hot mess. You got a couple of A lines right there. But notice here, you see these hyperechoic lines and they're going all the way down the screen. You can't see those A lines anymore. Plus you got this little thing going on, going back from the beginning. So A lines, these are B lines. B lines are bad. And notice how they completely white out certain areas. What is going on is that there's fluid that has accumulated. And that fluid distorts our image. So now we cannot see the posterior portions of the lung. We're, as we're going deeper down into the field, we've lost everything. And those B lines originate from the pleural line and they extend all the way down our screen and they eliminate, they, they extinguish those A lines. So B lines are bad, that's fluid. What is also bad, but really helpful to pick up is this. That's a, like a C lines or shred sign or subpleural consolidations, they go by different names, but this is pneumonia. What we're seeing here is the actual lung directly because fluid has accumulated in the lung and it now gives it more of like a hepatic look. So it looks a little more like the liver. However, what this actually is, is once again, it's the lung. And when we see this, this is pretty diagnostic in most cases for pneumonia. And what we did was we looked until we started seeing B lines and then we tracked those B lines until we see this. And now I can feel very confident that in the right clinical context, I'm diagnosing pneumonia. But if all I had seen, for example, were a whole bunch of B lines, maybe it could still be pneumonia, possibly more viral type. But if I'm seeing it all over the place, more likely that this is actually pulmonary edema and a CHF exacerbation. You can see how quickly you can use the blue protocol and just basic lung ultrasound to identify different pathologies and better treat your patients rather than doing a lot of guesswork and hoping that you're getting the right thing. I want to tie in another example here. This is the last example. This is with cardiac arrest. Now you can tell this is a high speed EMS because they have a lot of great things. They have a Lucas 3 device, so they have something that's doing chest compressions for them. They've got good technique as far as like they've got point of care blood tests. They also have a point of care ultrasound machine, which is really impressive. So they're doing ultrasound at the bedside. 
And this is better than even some emergency departments have. Not everyone has POCUS, not everyone has point of care labs, but that information can be extremely beneficial in cardiac arrest. Because what happens if you had a cardiac arrest of a patient and you got this ultrasound right here? You see all that anechoic fluid around here and that heart looks like it's struggling a bit. I'm not gonna go into explaining how exactly you would suspect uh, regular pericardial effusion versus tamponade, but if you see this and you're suspecting tamponade based on the findings, then now you can save this patient's life. You can do a pericardiocentesis when before you would have been guessing, you had kind of gone through your H's and T's of ACLS, but how do you really know that it's tamponade in most cases without an ultrasound? A lot of it's gonna be guesswork again, and you might just be sticking blindly to someone's heart. Is that really a good idea either? Well, now with ultrasound, I can quickly identify causes of cardiac arrest and be able to reverse them. Here's another example also in cardiac arrest. You have a patient who you get this on the rhythm strip and they have no pulse. Okay, it's probably asystole. And so you're just gonna keep doing your compressions or you may even call the code at this point, depending on how long you've been going for. But what if you actually had the ultrasound here? Notice how there's some kind of a lot of just jiggling in there, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of movement, but really nothing happening. This is actually fine ventricular fibrillation. So this is an asystole. This is fine V-fib. And you may have heard and you may see in the movies of people shocking asystole. Well, there may be a time and a place for it because while this looks like asystole, it's actually fine ventricular fibrillation. And I've had patients where I brought the ultrasound up, put it on their chest, they're reading asystole as the rhythm, but I can see this movement. We shock them, we get ROSC. And it's amazing when you see that happen, especially when you have EMS in the field say they've been in asystole the whole time, but really they've actually been most likely in fine V-fib the whole time, but no one defibrillated because no one anticipated that based on the rhythm that they got. So what I take away from this is that I'm gonna use this during certain checks, you know, pulse rhythm checks to see do I have some cardiac activity going on here? Is it organized or not? And is it something that's shockable or not? And this can really, really change management. Like I said, I've been able to see a lot of cases where we've been able to provide better chest compressions because we better identify where exactly to put compressions at. Also being able to identify V-fib, being able to identify causes of the cardiac arrest and being able to manage those. This is truly impressive. This is a game changer. You can save patients' lives doing this. Unfortunately, you can't save every life though. And you have to be able to know when should you terminate your resuscitation. And what you're seeing right here is an example of asystole. This is truly no cardiac motion. This is cardiac standstill. So what we're seeing is maybe just the slightest bit of movement as blood is just kind of pooling, but it's not really doing anything. And by being able to positively identify these patients and see who has been in cardiac arrest and has no cardiac motion, you've done your efforts, you've tried everything you can, and nothing is, is happening, there's nothing that's turning around that you can save this person and save their life, then you can accurately terminate your resuscitation. And the reason why this is so important is because we have seen in the past, it's like Lazarus event, where you have someone who has been declared deceased and then someone starts feeling for a pulse, maybe a few minutes later and realizes that there is a bit of a pulse and there might even be some agonal respirations, but it was missed all before because we didn't really have ultrasound to help confirm. So a lot of times when I reach the end of resuscitation, I'm usually taking a good look, something like this, for about 15 to 60 seconds, depending on you know, how concerned I am that this could be something going on. But ultimately, this is the way that we want to be able to use ultrasound to help us confirm that we have reached the end of our resuscitation and to help reassure those around us that what we're doing is the right thing for this patient by terminating these efforts. Hopefully at this point, I have convinced you that POCUS is the way to go. And you may be asking yourself, okay, well, I've bought in. Now what should I do? What are the next steps for me? And that's actually pretty easy because you don't have to go out and, and pay for a really expensive ultrasound machine. Neither does your department or your hospital or your facility. Instead, what you can do 
is you can get relatively inexpensive point of care ultrasound machines. So rather than paying twenty to hundred thousand dollars for a machine, for example, you can instead use money to buy anywhere from two thousand to ten thousand dollars and anywhere in between. These are just five common examples, not all of them, but five common examples of handheld POCUS devices. And handheld mean like, you know, sometimes they get referred to as pocket sized devices as well, but these are things that are ultra portable. Usually they can plug directly into some device. I will go through these just really quickly here. This example is the Philips Lumify. It plugs into an Android device. Uh, it is one that's a little bit different because most of the time it gets leased, but you can purchase. Uh, it varies a little bit, but you can get it anywhere from six to $10,000 is what I've seen. This is the iViz. This is from Sonosite, and it costs about $10,000 or more because it has individual probes that plug in, much like the uh, traditional ultrasound devices that you might be able to see. And then kind of running mid-range is the Clarius. The Clarius is different because it runs off of Bluetooth. There's no wire. All these others have wires to plug in. And it's kind of neat for that reason because there's also a bunch of different probes that you can get, some that you can't get with the others. And so it's, it's another potential option out there, and it runs about $6,900. If you're looking for something even a little less expensive, you have the GE V-Scan Extend. And this one starts at around $3,000 on up. It just depends on the model you get and how exactly you get it. But this is another good device that's out there. And then the least expensive that exists, and it works differently than the others because it doesn't use a crystal, but instead what it works off of is microchips. And this only costs about $2,000. There's an annual subscription that comes with it for a single user that's $420, but it is still a really good device because you can do quite a bit with just one transducer, whereas the others you can see like multiple heads or you have to buy different ones but this one is your kind of all in one in a sense. All right, now the next step, what are you gonna do about training? Right now, training is really difficult because it's hard to get to classes like these. They're, they're few and far between and you gotta worry about potentially infections and spreading disease. And so instead, you're, what you may run into is like more small group activities. And these are all pictures that I've done with Practical Pocus. Uh, which is an ultrasound educational company. You can find it at practicalpocus.com. And the neat thing is, is you can really start really simple. You can take your own ultrasound machine and practice on yourself like you're seeing right here. Or you can do it in a small group setting like we were talking about, um, maybe even practicing with colleagues and all working together to get better at POCUS. And then if you can, you wanna get some one-on-one -on -one mentorship whenever possible. So like in this case, we're doing it where we're looking at images and reviewing it and teaching off of it. But this can also be done remotely where you can have someone review your images. And these are all things, like I said, we, we've been able to do with Practical Pocus, but other ultrasound education companies are doing this as well. And importantly, you wanna be able to apply this clinically, right? So you need to have practice with this in a clinical setting and, and generally, we want somewhere between 150 and 300 exams for you to practice to kind of get the general concepts of ultrasound and kind of really get a good solid foundation. You want obviously some pathology mixed in with this too. Now you may think to yourself, like, holy cow, 300 exams? Like, that's gonna take me forever to do. And realistically, it's not because there are a couple of ways to make this easier for yourself. One is that maybe you only practice one skill at a time and try and do anywhere from 25 to 50 of those exams. And another thing that you can easily do is that you combine exams. So for example, right here, you're seeing part of the EFAST exam with trauma. This is actually three separate exams because we're looking at the heart, we're gonna look at the lungs, and we're gonna look at the abdomen. And each one of those counts as a different exam. This actually plays a role with reimbursement too. But this is something that you can combine these exams and get a lot of detail, but also be able to practice. Now it's 100 EFAS exams versus 300 individual exams as just one example. Ultimately, the other part of this that you want to look at too is being able to expand your role over time. So like I said, you need to see pathology. Well, sometimes you don't have a lot of time in the emergency department or clinic or wherever you're working at to maybe be able to examine every single patient. And that's totally understandable. At least do a few exams, maybe five exams a day. 
And if possible, if you know that someone has pathology, examine them. So for example, maybe you're on a busy shift, but you have someone who comes back with their chest x-ray showing pneumonia. Well, go to the bedside, explain to the patient like, hey, I'm just trying to get a look here. And most of the time patients are very receptive. They want to be able to see this too, and they know that it's helping you. So you can use the ultrasound to show them their pneumonia potentially on the ultrasound and get some good practice with some pathology that you know is there. Once you get a little bit better, you can start scanning and making a mental note. Well, I think there's pneumonia here. Get your confirmatory testing, which is usually going to be like a chest x-ray. Sometimes you might need a CT, but you get whatever confirmatory test you normally would for that study and see are you right or wrong. And keep in mind that you may not be perfect all the time or that image that you're going to get is not going to be perfect all the time, but this is a great way to get practice quickly. Ultimately, this leads to the end goal of getting credentialed and privileged in doing ultrasound at your facility. We already talked about the process of how to get there. You have to practice. You have to be able to show competence in this. But by doing those exams, having these, whether they're overread or having some way to confirm, uh, for me, the way that I had to do it first was I was entirely self-taught. And so I had to be able to show that I had some confirmatory tests like I was just talking about. And later on, I've, I've had feedback and support along the way. So even if you don't have someone there, you want to be able to have someone to work with. But when push really comes to shove, there are ways to learn on your own. And like I said, you want to be able to go through the process so that way you can apply for your privileging and get it. And the nice thing is then you can start billing for it. And with as inexpensive as some of these devices are and with training that you can get at a fairly low cost too, you can pay for all this in a matter of days, weeks, and maybe if you're not using it a ton, months, but you get a complete return of investment because these ultrasound exams pay really well. Uh, depending on what you're doing for your regular exams, uh, you can look at anywhere from 25 to $50, maybe even more, especially for procedure type exams. But ultimately the big goal here, the thing I want you to understand, the thing I want you to take away from all of this is that POCUS is extremely beneficial for your practice. And you can do this all relatively easily because the training is relatively straightforward. You're not trying to do everything with this. You'll learn more and more with time, but these are relatively easy exams to perform. You've already seen five great examples of pathology that was really easy to pick up. And I'm hoping that through this process, you'll be able to start feeling comfortable with, recognize and acknowledge that you too can start using POCUS and go through the process. And like I said, I would be happy to teach you. I hope I can one day teach all of you. But ultimately, my goal is to let you know that it's not that scary out there. The future of POCUS being the standard of care is now here. It is becoming more and more widely accepted and expected. So don't fall behind. Take the time, take some courses, get better and improve your patient care.